What is your name? My name is Genevieve Bell. And you are a cultural anthropologist, technologist, futurist, an expert in the relationship between technology and humans. Is that right? Yes. All right. So, <laughs> Among other things. <laughs> are we alone in the universe? Of course not. Of course not. Of course not. Why do you say that? Well, I mean, I guess because as a good anthropologist, there's so many bits of that question I want to ask you what you mean by. Okay, I'm going to do that. What do you mean we? What That's do you what mean I'm alone? You. What do you mean the universe? Okay, next question. In the question, are we alone, what does the word we mean for you? <laughs> well, you could be an anthropologist. That's right. excellent. Uh, well, that's always a really good question. Who is the we in that sentence? Well, are humans alone in the universe? Is that the question? Half the people I ask think that we as humans. The other half think we are the life forms on Earth. Interesting. And then I guess I would ask, having grown up and worked in lots of different places, whether we isn't necessarily just the things that are living. So are we alone as a lot, you know, are we alone as humans? Well, I would argue clearly not. You know, does the we there include... But when you say, are we alone as humans, what do you say clearly not? Why do you say that? Um, because for lots of human cultures, the we-ness isn't just about humans. It's about the environment around you. It's about the things that are living in that environment that aren't human things. Some of those things would not be counted inside the Western scientific tradition as living things. Okay, so you're an animist. Let's say you're an animist. You're from a hunter-gatherer culture. Your religion is animism. And I ask you, are we alone? How do you understand the word we? Uh, I think depending on where you were, you might understand the we as being your ancestors. You might understand it as being well, wait, your the ancestors children. are always there, and so you... so they are part of your we. Yes. Uh huh. They are part of your we, and so are are you and your ancestors alone in the universe? Well, I think you might imagine the answer to that is no, because, because. there are possibly the gods or spirits or creative forces that gave rise to the universe that are still actors in a sense, that they are giving rise to other things that you are not a party to. It could be about notions about what those ancestral figures are and how they function. So we're not alone because look, there's my brother up there in the sky, he's a star constellation. Yeah, or because that constellation is a living thing that is part of the weeness. Okay, so it's a, it depends on the difference of what alive means and what, okay, mm -hmm. how about the word alone, what does that mean? Ah, uh, so... The reason I'm asking you this is because half the people think that if we find bacteria, microbes on Mars, we'll still be alone because we can't talk to it. Oh. And half the other people say, <laughs> <laughs> if you're the more scientific mind, say, oh, yo, then we'll not be alone anymore. So how about you, what's your take on this? Well, it's a fascinating notion of what that question indexes, right? I mean, lurking inside of that is a really interesting kind of notion, I suspect, an, an unpacked notion about uh, human exceptionalism and about the notion that we have a kind of, that there is a we and that it is special such that we are singular. I mean, alone does imply a ranking order of what it would take to not be alone anymore. So, you know, do we imagine we are alone because there's nothing else like us? Well. That's already a fairly uh, complicated question historically, right? There were lots of moments in time where people in different parts of the world that we currently inhabit imagined they were alone because they hadn't been somewhere else and they hadn't seen anything else. And even when they got there, I'm fairly certain they didn't always imagine that the things they encountered were like them. Am I or are we obsessed with this question because we're social animals? Um, Would I orangutans ask this question? And if not, why? Or if they had a bigger brain, would they say, "Hey, I'm happy to be. I'm not happy. I'm happy to be solitary. Therefore, I don't think it's a big deal." To I'm not sure it's about brain size as much it is about a notion of wanting to either uh, reify our specialness. So, of course, we are alone because we are, you know, the intelligent force here. So there can't be anything else that can either threaten that. Uh, space, hence the, you know, some people go, well, if it's bacteria, sure, well, actually, the bacteria aren't anything like us, so are we still, quote, unquote, superior to it? Unclear. Um, alone in that sense, I mean, again, I think it sort of suggests uh, if you mean are there other things like us, I think it's still about the what is like and what is us. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. for me, can you imagine that there may be other things that cultures would value 
and say were relevant beyond what was right here, sure. But we had this, we had this debate. I, I was raised in an intellectual tradition that is willing to concede to a certain degree of cultural relativism. So can I imagine that there are cultures in the world that fully believe that they are not alone in the world? Yes. Well, I'm not that interested in cultural relativism. I'm interested in speciesism and species relativism. Well, but speciesism is a cultural category, right? Is we, it? Is it? I well, I would argue that, you know, not so. Has the world as it currently exists, so, you know, we're sitting in Australia where we know there have, this has been a peopled place for at least 60,000 years. In every one of those 60,000 years, did the inhabitants of this piece of land imagine that species was the way to make sense of what was around them? No. Oh. Even for the 200 and what, 20 plus years that uh, there have been white settler populations here, was speciesism the only way to make sense of things? Well, oh, they no. Know about Darwinism, did they? Exactly, because. Non scientific people. All right, well, so. Well, well, but Darwin, Darwin's vision of the world was contested when he wrote it and is contested still. Does that mean it's right or wrong? Mm -hmm. But you know, it is, it is a body of knowledge that has not always existed. So in that okay. way, there were moments in time when you could have imagined there was something beyond speciesism, which I mean imagines that you can imagine something after it too. Okay. <laughs> I, I'll agree with that. Um, oh, thanks. Are, <laughs> like gold star for now, me. Are humans unique just like every other species is unique or are our uniqueness is special in a way that other animals are not. Kind of like what you were addressing earlier. If special, how did we get that way? Wow, that is such a loaded question. It, it is, I load them up as much as I can. Yeah, but that's a question that also suggests that um, those uh, worldviews, teleologies, epistemologies, whatever frame you want to use there, that are somehow uh, extensible for everyone. So what if it is the case that there are human beings on this planet who don't think that human beings are the only things that are special or the only things that are intelligent or the only yes, things yes, that yes. are exceptional? Right. I mean, most, when I give a lecture about astrobiology, I inevitably get asked, are humans unique? And I said, yes, humans are unique just like every other species. And then they kind of scratch their head and they said, what does that mean? And that's what I'm asking you. Uh, yeah, well, so, you know, are there things that make humans distinct from goats? Sure. Are there things that make, things that make goats, goats distinctive, distinctive from, from, from chairs? Yes. And goats <laughs> distinctive from humans. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I think we agree that humans are unique just like every other species. But the question is, is there a different kind of special uniqueness that humans have that is different from the other species that we could list? Well, we have in certainly the post-enlightenment Western tradition, we have liked to imagine that was true. We have told ourselves do all- Do you believe that? I know that we tell ourselves that all the time. The question is, do you think that's a correct way of seeing things or a constructive I th way? I think that's a cultural way of seeing things that is particular to a particular moment in time and place and space. Okay, so, you can, so you're a relativist when it comes to these things. Uh, listen, I believe it is the case that that framework doesn't exist everywhere and the places it doesn't exist may not be wrong. Okay. But I also think it is, as a, it is a cultural artifact that is deeply revelatory. Of our vanity. Um, of a particular intellectual project over time that's had enormous consequences. I mean, that is an intellectual project that for a long time meant that we saw Aboriginal people as not even human. It meant we saw women as second-class citizens because they didn't have the same intellectual capacity as men. It meant that we saw certain kinds of everything from body shapes to skull sizes as indicative of otherness within the human species. So that notion of human specialness hasn't always and still doesn't include all humans. And it's, been used, and it's been used as an incredibly divisive intellectual tool to enact all manner of incredible Whoa, wait, 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 back up for a second. So, in the Western tradition, we talk about humans, and in, I guess, hunter-gatherer cultures, they think often the word for humans is the word for their group. Yeah. And from, and so, that, yes. so we have that type of exclusivity at all levels and all, almost all times is for human groups. Oh, absolutely, but I think we have advanced the notion of human capacity has had 
particularly at scale and particularly that form of it, has had materially complicated consequences in the last I hundred should. years. In your 2017 Boyer lectures, you investigated what it means to be human. So what does it mean to be human? Uh, I don't think I answered that question on purpose. Oh, you, you, that was the title, but you didn't answer it. No. I asked the question, what does it mean to be human? I didn't say I knew. Is it an important question? Um, I think it is a question that we are asking again in a different context as technology comes along. So we can talk about, you know, would life somewhere else make us less special? Are we alone in the universe? Those are one set of questions that raise a very particular set of anxieties. I think there's been pressure put again on the notion of being human by the possibility of technologies that start to have human capacity. So things like the bundle of technologies that form artificial intelligence are sometimes seen as scary because they threaten to uh, perform a set of functions that humans like to imagine are theirs and theirs alone, i.e. human scale intelligence. And so the notion of what it means to be human is a conversation that happens simultaneously as we find bacteria <laughs> or the possibility of bacteria in other parts of the universe as much as it happens when we start to say what would it mean to have a technology that could do things that were historically reserved for humans. Human brains are big compared to our bodies. How do you think that happened? Why did that happen? Human brains are big compared to our bodies. We have a big EQ, a cyclization quotient compared to other animals. So what, what do you, well, I guess, what do you mean by brain there? I mean, like you mean our physical number of, system. so a number of neurons compared to other creatures, the number of pathways, the capacity to do certain kinds of tasks. I guess uh, as objectively you, as that can be measured, I guess brain volume to body, body mass, brain mass to body mass. This is, this is Jer a guy named Jarris that invented this mm -hmm. civilization quotient and he made this brain mass divided by body mass to the two-thirds power and that's called the encephalization quotient. And so this is something oh, that you can objectively measure and humans come out because we've chosen that this yeah. axis to, to, as the biggest. So why do you think our brain is somehow abnormally large compared to the pattern of all the other well, many other mammals. Well, a better question would be, what was that metric in service of and what are we missing by Humans, talking? Human uniqueness, of course. What are... Well, so, I mean, uh, there's some interesting work emergent looking at notions of brains and brain function in non-human living organisms. So, there's a bunch of work happening on bees at the moment, so mm -hmm. bee consciousness and bees. Mm -hmm. And the thing about bees, I never get all the numbers quite right, but the average bee apparently has, I think the number is somewhere around 940,000, is that right? 940,000 neurons. Human, by contrast, is like 84 billion. So I mean, this is, we're talking a huge delta there. Yes, yes. Um, dogs are like half a billion. I mean, it's like this, you know, the big numbers there, right, basically. Maybe but, when, but what I'm getting but, but, at but, but, but what's yeah. interesting about that, right, was that it used to be the case that the argument was, well, you know, you need an enormous number of neurons to do certain kinds of tasks. But the guys who are now looking at what bees can do mm -hmm. are pretty clear that you know the number of neurons that a bee has, the average bee has over a lifetime of nine weeks, gets you to a significant number of functions. Mm -hmm. There is communication of information between bees. There is storage and transmission of knowledge. There is uh, location-based data. There is- You're preaching to the choir here. A series of activities, and what they start to say is, well, maybe counting neurons is the way, wrong way to talk about mm -hmm. brain function. Maybe what we need to talk about is pathways or interconnects, which in bees look quite different and are more active. Maybe it's about the fact that e we are not, because we have always imagined, in a scientific sense, at least for the last 150 years, that humans were at the top of an evolutionary chain, we have then retrofitted all of our formulations that say, well, if humans are the most intelligent, then what do we have that everyone else doesn't have really big heads and big brains? So it must be all about the brains, so and now we're just going to retrofit everything else. Yes. And the big consciousness work is interesting because what it starts to say is, well, actually, you can get a lot of stuff done with a lot less. So mm -hmm. maybe this is the wrong argument we should be having. So, you know, what then passes for consciousness or sentience or awareness, do you have to have a sense of, well, self, so would bees have beeness? Do you ever have to have a sense of right, beeness? Right. Well, as a scientist, most physicists are try to avoid such arguments, and then they say, for example, SETI researchers, they're looking for a life elsewhere, they say, ah, 
I'm, all I'm looking for is technological civilization. What does that mean? They have a radio telescope that I can talk with. And so there's a very operational definition. And whether that the possession of a radio telescope is associated with a big brain or not, they're kind of agnostic about that. They don't care. So the question is, I guess, we have seem to have this technology that enables us to talk across to maybe other stars and other planets around other stars. And the question is, uh, why did that evolve, or how did that evolve, or, or on Earth? I mean, technology, why? For example, let's go back, let's play this game of going in the time machine, going back. Look, Stephen Jay Gould did this to the Precambrian 450 million mm -hmm. years ago, and I'd like to ask you, do you think anything like humans would evolve again? But we could also play the same game and go back 100,000 years and ask, will technology evolve again? Do, no. Well, I guess it means it depends what you mean by technology. I, I mean, mean, you know, cameras, the radio telescopes, uh, yeah, but we know, telescopes, microscopes. But those were driven by, as much by funding models and ideas about power as they were by. Fine, I don't care what the, the question uh, is. How how common in the universe are the selective pressures that we might be able to identify here that has produced that? Well, you know, given ironically that one of the most important selective pressures selective pressures that produced all of that was God and the invention of the church. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting thing to say, well, you know, do we imagine the life elsewhere would invent God mm -hmm. or have God mm -hmm. such that you would have institutional religion, such that you would have a concentration of power and wealth and knowledge such that you would then mm -hmm. invest further in it. Okay, and what's the answer? I always think the invention of God's a very human thing. Though it turns out that you can evidence that primates are doing it too. So do you think that aliens don't have God? I didn't say that. No, you didn't. But I'm asking you, is that what you, kind of what you said? No. No, it's not. No? I just said that you can talk about technology as though it were an abstract thing, but the reality is what it is that you imagine that is technical if you then say to me, well, the, the proof of technology is a camera and a radio telescope, I go, yeah, okay. I think we can look at cultural systems, again, 60,000 years old, they didn't produce a radio telescope or a camera. Does that mean they weren't technical? Well, let's forget whether they're technical or not. Let's just ask about radio telescopes then. Let's forget the word technical and then say, do you... If Does everyone need to invent a radio telescope in order to be a human exceptionalist? No, but in order to, co <laughs> in order to communicate between stars, yes. I guess. Do you have any other alternatives for communicating across four or five, ten, hundred light years? Well, that's an interesting way to imagine that's the only way that you communicate, you're not alone. Well, that's what SETI researchers are all about themselves. So they try to avoid all of these hemming and hawing and all these relativistic about intelligence. I, I'm with you with all that. And so they say, forget all that, does it have a radio telescope? And there's a simplicity, there's an operational definition. It is deeply instrumentalist, it's kind of lovely. <laughs> it's kind of good luck with that. <laughs> okay, good. What's your question about your civilization? Do you have a radio telescope? Yeah. Okay, check. You don't have a radio telescope? Sorry, That's, not civilized. Well, it's not, Moving there's no, on. There's no, uh, yeah, there is. The, the, I don't think <laughs> that's necessarily for bias. There. They just want to commune. They were trying to answer a question are we alone in the universe? And one way to do that, that is, is to, to say, well, does everyone else have a radio telescope? Because if they that's do, the they only, if that's the only way, then that's what you have to do. Well, that's right? because that's the communication mechanism we've developed. That's do right. we imagine so if you were some post, everywhere else is dark? Well, yeah, but that's the only way. If you imagine that light is only made by lampposts. So <laughs> what is it? What is it if there are you know other people around in the world, other people in the universe, other other forms of life in the universe that don't actually think radio telescopes are the only way to go, like. At the moment, it's a hammer nail problem, right? We're radio telescopes, so we hope other people, we hope other, other life forces in the universe will communicate to us via a radio telescope. We're not, we're not hoping, we're exploring the possibilities. So. At the moment, you're basically suggesting you're hoping that that's what well, they have, because so that's, that's, that's the only mechanism we've got at the moment. If you have a radio telescope, that'd be great. That's right. that's, well, that means we could communicate. That means well, we could know that you're there. And if you don't, then well, we can't know. Except there are some other things, too, we can well, look at. So, Now the reason I keep asking, uh, the reason I'm asking this is because one of the biggest questions is. It is kind of fascinatingly delightful, right? So it inexplicably makes me think of the the Recorrimento. Do you know this piece? So what is that? A piece of music or is it? No, no. Nope. So when the Spanish entered the New World. Oh, this is what they read to the Indians. This is what they read to oh, the native peoples yes. in the you Caribbean. Don't Christ, then you're going from to the end of a boat, right? So. Right, right. 
the in the 1500s, the papacy divided up the world. They gave part of South America to the Portuguese and the other half to the Spanish. There was a kind of a deal that as you went off into the New World, you had to you know, bring souls to God. And so part of the way that worked was that when the boats turned up in the Caribbean, someone stood on the prow of the boat and declaimed to the gathered masses who were looking at this boat, this document, which basically said, you know, now that you've heard the word of God, you are God's soldiers. You've also heard the word of the Spaniards, so you are now the dominion of the, you know, the king and queen of Spain. Um, and they read it in Spanish, uh, Hebrew, because they thought they were looking for the lost tribes of Jerusalem, and a few other, you know, I think Latin. Cortez did this when he landed, and, like and they Pizarro all did. as well. Columbus, um, the, the Columbus, guy. Columbus. Really? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Like this, this recorrimento mm. was like you know declaimed off the end of the boat, and of course for a whole bunch of people standing there, if you didn't speak yeah. Spanish or Hebrew, which would have been un unlikely, <laughs> yes, yes, how yes. do you know what you're looking at, right? Now you're using because you're an anthropologist, you're talking about I guess human groups. I'm basically saying the recorrimento was a radio telescope, and if you didn't on the other end have a receiving radio telescope, you just looked at that that transmission. Was well, un, un, if the Spanish insensible. Were, well, the Spanish insensible? were but we're not in in SETI. We're listening. We're not broadcasting. And that's yes, but a so imagine difference. so imagine that you are now the person on the shore, yeah. and what's come at you is the recorrimento, yes. and you have no capacity to hear it. Well, the, what Does we're it, trying to do is distinguish between the noise of the leaves and the trees and something that and is some associated person with person on them. a boat saying hi, you're ours. Something that's not. Um, Something that's not leaves and trees, or something that's not, uh, yeah. I guess, associated with what we sometimes call intelligence. Yeah. So I guess, I mean, I, I, and what I guess I'm pushing on is that one of the challenges is whether you are listening or speaking, you've already made a determination about what the signal or noise is. Well, right? that's what they're trying to do right now. Yeah, they're trying exactly. to hide. There's hundreds of millions of dollars, not hundred, maybe ten million dollars, trying trying to get figure, people to figure out. Okay, what is the signal? What's the noise? Oh, exactly. And that's not an easy question. Well, and of course, about. well, as we you know, as we know, in fact, uh, in the contemporary world of current technologies, we've actually gotten to a point where some things that used to just be noise can be signal. Yes. Yes. RFID tags, Wi-Fi. What did you say? RFID tags. RFID tags. And Wi-Fi. So you can actually radio use... Radio frequency interference and detect... What are they? Uh, uh, radio frequency ID tags. The kind of things that are on oh. clothes and department stores or just regular Wi-Fi signals. Oh. You can actually look at the ways in which those signals are disrupted by bodies. So me being in this room, there is a wireless router out there. Me waving my hands around annoys your camera but disrupts the way the Wi-Fi signal moves. Mm -hmm. You can actually now read my disruption of the signal, right. which used to just be noise, becomes itself a way of making sense of what's going on in the room. So it's not what the signal was built for, but my right. disruption of it oh. leaves a pattern too. So right. what is now noise actually also becomes signal. Right, it's kind of like the, the uh, dog that didn't bark in the night with Sherlock Holmes. That kind was, of. That was the yeah. signal. Anyway, should we expect human-like intelligence elsewhere in the universe? Carl, Carl Sagan said that there were many different ways to evolve functionally equivalent humans, his term. He thought that human-like intelligence is a universal niche that uh, we should expect elsewhere. Should or shouldn't? Should. should. There are many biologists disagree with Carl. What do you think? Well, I think given that we can hardly agree to what human intelligence is on Earth, the notion that, that, that you know, given that I don't think we have an agreed to notion of what human intelligence looks like, and we certainly have multiple enactments of human activity, mm -hmm. <laughs> both culturally and within cultures. Um, if you imagine that much diversity is possible in one place. But all that diversity has a common origin on Earth. Indeed. Presumably, whatever evolves elsewhere will have a, at least a slightly different origin mm -hmm. and therefore maybe a very different path. True. But you know, you can imagine, given a range of diverse outcomes, things that are at least commensurate are possible. It depends on how view, you view this space of, that evolution can explore. If it's an infinite space, then any particular instantiation is one is off. A, well, one off is probability zero. On the other, if you say, "Oh no, it's restricted," and then you have your have a range, then a hey, probability of whatever the ratio between that and this is. So, how do you view that? Well. I think even if it were a limited range and a possibility of some kind of duplication, the notion that there would be an encounter that was 
not fraught seems slight. Fraught. Okay, so the fraught encounter has been used as an argument by Stephen Hawking and others who think we should keep our head down. We should not broadcast our presence to outer space. Oh, I don't mean fraught in that sense. I simply mean it's, it is routinely very difficult to communicate across a shared cultural frame yes. and a shared history. So you and I trained in a similar set of traditions, in a similar set of institutions circulating through a limited number of places can have remarkable lack of shared understanding, despite the fact we ostensibly speak the same language in the same place. Multiply that out. I don't mean fraught in the, you know, Skynet goes live and kills us all, but I do mean fraught in the... Talking past each other. Yeah. And not even just talking past each other, non-shared frames of reference at a multiple level. All right, so I wanted to ask you this question. If you know, we have a common ancestor of chimpanzees about seven million years ago. Let's mm -hmm. suppose that humans kill ourselves. And in the Planet of the Apes scenario, then the, the chimpanzees evolve into humans. So the idea there, I guess the assumption is, let's go back seven million years, replay the tape of life, then, then something like humans will evolve. And do you think that's the, what do you think of that idea? You do know Planet of the Apes is science fiction, right? I, I do, but so it, it's science fiction that appeals to a very, it's easy to slide into that worldview. And that's why it's a popular movie, because they think that our adaptations are so useful that if we go extinct, other species will evolve into the intelligence niche. So we imagine there is a niche that's universal, independent of us. See, I also think it's a form of science fiction because it plays out a very particular set of anxieties. Anxieties? Yes, which is that there may not be that much that actually separates us from primates. Yes, okay, but, the, but they didn't, they evolved obviously towards being human beings. Mm -hmm. In other words, they closed this gap that we think is there now. The question is, is it, it, I, I suspect that there is no selection pressure towards human-like intelligence and therefore chimpanzees would just stay as chimpanzees, happy to be that. So that would, but that implies that if we go back seven million years in a time machine, that humans will not re-evolve. If we and had a time machine, I'm not sure I'd be going back seven million years. At other places, I might want to go first. Sure, you do. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is one experiment in time travel. Just one experiment. Oh, yeah. So the question that really comes down to how convergent, how much selection pressure in a broad universal way is there to produce something that produces telescopes and technology and computers and... I don't, I don't know I know the answer to that, Charlie. Um, I mean, that's, it's so far outside of my training. I'm not a biologist, I'm not an evolutionary biologist. I don't, those are, I mean, in some ways those are intensely abstract questions that again, I want to say reveal an enormous amount about where we are sitting right now and not necessarily a great deal about what happened seven million years ago. Okay, you're a futurist, so let's go seven no, million years. No, I'm not years. even a futurist. It says that in your website. You must be, that's what it says. Oh, wow, you believe everything you read on the <laughs> internet? Gosh, we have gonna, so many other questions we should have about human intelligence. <laughs> I'm gonna hold you to it. Anyway, so a lot of, for example, a lot of astronomers think that uh, we are quickly evolving to be non-biological creatures and general AI is coming and then essentially we shouldn't be looking on the surfaces of planets for life elsewhere. We should be looking for inorganic machines and cameras and satellites. Code, you know. code elsewhere. Was that? I said code elsewhere. Yeah, right. Code elsewhere? Well, as in we shouldn't be looking for life elsewhere, we should be looking for code elsewhere. Yes, for example. So what do you think of that idea? Uh, well humans here on this planet have been augmenting themselves with technology for tens of thousands of years. They have been physically changing the dimensionality and aspects of their bodies with what we would think of as more modern technologies for at least 500 years. You and I both wear glasses. Uh, chances are we have taken certain kinds of medications in our lives to counteract things in the world around us. Mm -hmm. uh, Chances are we have a certain reliance on things like mobile devices, the internet, from which you sourced a slightly erroneous biography of me. Um, you know, <laughs> we continue to you know augment our bodies with technology, right? That's not a new story. Mm -hmm. The notion that that might go from augmenting our physical selves to our cognitive selves also isn't a new story. You know, the invention and multiple sites of invention, in fact, of the printing. I'm, I'm not claiming it's a new story. What I what I'm. Uh, but you, 
Okay. The notion of the, you know, the multiple site invention of, say, the printing press mm -hmm. was an idea where we suddenly outsourced a whole lot of things that had been cognitive functions mm -hmm. to physical objects. Okay. Uh, did we worry in that moment that we were going to be replaced by books? There were certainly some... I'm not worrying about this. I'm just saying is that a lot of people think, oh, that's what's going to happen. And so we should be looked, and that's going to happen elsewhere too because it's somehow a universal feature of intelligent life evolution, and that's what we should be looking for. That's the argument. Well, if what the argument, if one way to read that argument is to say what it might mean to look for intelligence rather than life, if you want to reframe that question and say what would intelligence look like, most people are looking for intelligence, life, intelligent life, and they don't care about life because life is microbes. They don't care about microbes on Earth. So well, that seems to be foolish. Um, <laughs> insofar as that, you know, viruses would seem to be a fairly interesting living object. For so many we, of us. So it would be yeast. But for many um, people not. But, you know, so is another way of thinking about looking for life, about parsing out the notion of intelligence and life and saying, does intelligence get manifested in things other than human bodies? You know, can we say that, you know, code objects, algorithmic objects, do they become self-learning and autonomous and self-reproducing? Mm, we've got early examples of that. Would you go looking for lines of code rather than physical bodies? Well, I think, for example, the, I think Martin Rees, a royal astronomer, astronomer royale, I think he's from, he thinks that we should stop looking for life on other planets and look, focus on our, our searches in interstellar space, intergalactic space, looking for satellites. Uh, and probes, and uh, I guess anything else that would be uh, what we're produce we're starting to produce now. So that question then. So he is, doesn't want to go looking for radio telescopes. He wants to go looking for evidence of people putting stuff into space. Well, radio telescopes will be in space very soon. So that's not, that's not a distinction. Just checking. <laughs> concerned about that. A little concerned about this radio telescope problem. Um, well, you know. So again, I mean, it goes back to saying how would. What are the mechanisms by which we imagine we will see intelligence elsewhere are, of course, much like our science fiction, products of the imaginations we have in the now, right? Mm -hmm. So we now know you can put things into space. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we imagine other people somewhere else on the, the world of the universe mm -hmm. might have done the same thing. Yeah. So well, the question we're trying to evaluate, not might, we're trying to evaluate that might. Is that a high likelihood or a low likelihood? Is this a one-off thing that is the unique kind of like the English language, or is it some general feature of evolution in the universe? Unique. The English language is hardly unique. It's a trade language. There are multiple versions of those on the planet. Well, that's what I've seen. Every language is unique. What I'm saying is it's so quirky that nobody's looking for English-speaking aliens, but they are looking for technological aliens. So they put technology in a more generic category than a particular language. Well, now they're not looking for English-speaking aliens. There was a moment in time when I'm sure we imagined that's what they would be speaking. <laughs> <laughs> or Spanish, see the, <coughs> see the recorrimento. I see, okay. Now let's see. Um, is the question, are we alone, an important question? I think it's a revelatory question. A revelatory. Is that important? Revelation? Yes. I think, you know, the questions we ask of our worlds are deeply indexical. They tell us a great deal about how we imagine ourselves and how we imagine the world. They're not necessarily statements of truth, but they are statements of cultural practice and preoccupation. Is this the most important question you can think of? No. What's the most important question you can think of? Uh, beyond where's my next coffee coming from, which is always a practical question. Uh, listen, I think you know the more important questions for me might be questions about how do we build a set of cultures and practices that are environmentally sustainable such that we can still be here in 100 years to worry about the nature of planets beyond our planet. Can we think about a set of mechanisms by which we can create healthy and functioning cultures and polities and political structures such that we would have the resources to build radio telescopes? Can we think about creating systems of justice such that we would build societies that might be societies that you would wish would encounter otherness somewhere else on the universe? If I gave you a hundred billion dollars with the caveat that you had to spend it to try to answer the question, are we alone, how would you spend it? Well, apparently I'd build radio telescopes. No, that's what and I spend might, them that's And spend them into space. <laughs>
Okay, are you ask. likely? Are you likely to give me a hundred billion dollars? No, no, that seems like an excellent it's a thought. Proposition. It's a thought experiment here. We don't give experiment. So, if I give you a hundred billion dollars, with the caveat, you have to spend it to try to answer the question: Are we alone? How would you spend it? Well, I should think you'd have to start with who's the we and who's the alone. Okay. And I don't think that'll cost you a hundred million dollars. I think that will be cheaper. There's a hundred billion on here. Oh, even God! Sorry, I've already dis I've already discounted it significantly. Yeah. Um, well, I think you'd actually, I mean, I do think there is these sort of these first principle questions, right, of what is the we that, what is the we that we imagine is somehow singular? Mm -hmm. What does alone mean? Mm -hmm. And what is it that we imagine signals of otherness would look like? Because I do think if you were going to spend a sizable percentage of that hundred billion dollars on technological infrastructures to do listening and noise making, signal and noise activities, or you need to have an understanding about what you might imagine that would be somewhere else. And I think you'd have to go beyond some of the worldviews we currently have about those things. Why not make a space probe that'll travel to the nearest stars and see if, and we, where we think there are Earth-like planets and then check them out? That seems like a reasonable activity. It's probably not the only activity. And if you had $100 billion, why weren't you already doing that? And again, I'm an anthropologist. So I'm going to tell you that it's about how do you ask the right questions? How do you think about putting the right people in the room? And why is it that that's what you're going to spend $100 billion on when there are probably some other more pressing concerns? Okay, now I asked one Indian student the same question. He said uh, he would uh, invest it in economic equality. And, and I asked him, why do that? And he said, well, it's, well you have to, if you want to find out whether you're alone or not, you have to keep on existing. Mm -hmm. And so he would, and because he felt that economic inequality was a threat to our existence, that he yeah, well, hence the I think you know the more important questions are about environmental sustainability, cultural health, yes, that's what and he long was, term that's what he was you know, and long term you so know, he would say, hey, you, to, in order to detect anything, you got to stay alive. To stay alive, we have to do this, and that's mm -hmm. what he said. Yeah. You're sympathetic with that view. I'm sympathetic with the view that says the quest to know if we are alone in the universe is an important quest. The quest to ensure that the place we are currently living is sustainable ought to be equally valuable and important. Arthur C. Clarke said any sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable, from, indistinguishable from, from, magic. from magic. Right, and there's a guy named Carl Schroeder who said, mm -hmm. you know this, I think I told you, we talked mm -hmm. about this earlier, yep. and he said, no, Carl, Arthur, you're wrong. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from nature. And that makes SETI a really hard problem if, if advanced civilizations are everywhere hugging trees and not, you know, making gigantic artificial signals. So are, you're in the Carl Schroeder camp here in this debate or in this issue? Um, I mean, I sometimes think Clark's wrong, but for a different reason. I actually think any sufficiently advanced technology should be able to make magic, not be indistinguishable from it. And I think those are two different things, right? I think the purpose of much technology is not about uh, the notion of being indistinguishable from magic. It's an interesting notion. It suggests that those are oppositional factors, whereas often science you, is. You, so you said you're making a distinction between being magic and indistinguishable from magic. Is making it? magic, making magic. being indistinguishable from magic. Okay. And how about the same same dichotomy for nature? What's natural? What do we mean when we talk about nature? Okay. What is that? Is that the human versus nature? Okay, that's a dichotomy. I guess that it is makes that. parking lot versus living, uh, you know, a natural park or something. Well, so does nature include the ancestral spirits that gave form to the land? I don't know. You have to ask your ancestral spirits that question. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. So I asked you, is the question, are we alone, important? I think you said, I'll, I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> but more generally, is it important to understand our origins, the big picture, scientific story of Genesis? This is what we're doing in astrobiology, trying mm -hmm. to understand the big picture of our origins. Does it make a person a better person if they know more about their origins in this scientific way? Are you trying to do that? Is that part of your worldview to try to understand yourself scientifically, how you got here? In which sense? Well, the evolution of humans, for example. I think your parents were anthropologists, so you probably know all about uh, Lucy and you know, astrophysicians. No, and my mom's an anthropologist. My dad's an engineer. Okay. All right. Well, anyway. Sure. So, I mean, I grew up listening to the stories about the origins of humans as they are currently configured, but I heard those stories the first time 40 years ago. 
we now have a different set of data that suggests that many of those stories were erroneous. When I was taught that there were Neanderthals and then Neanderthals just went away and Homo sapiens emerged. Mm -hmm. And at the time, and I taught that theory at university when I was a faculty member years ago, and at the time we used to tell a story about the evolution of the human species that was both linear and in retrospect incredibly naive mm -hmm. because there was no notion that any of those things were going to be co-present. Now we have an increasing amount of material evidence mm -hmm. that suggests that there was a long period of overlap between Neanderthals and what we would think of as you know the ancestors of contemporary humans, Homo sapiens. And of course, it now makes sense to kind of say, well, yeah, <laughs> it didn't just go, oh, the Homo sapiens are here, we should all just spontaneously stop existing. Of course, they intermarried, fought, shared spaces, were eventually pushed to the perimeters of Europe, <laughs> you know, lingered probably far longer than we imagine, which is to say one of the challenges is whatever story we tell about where we came from, at any moment in time it's being told, it feels like it's the final story and we get new information and have to have almost Kuhnian paradigm shifts in how we think about that stuff. So are those useful scientific explorations? Yes. Is the temptation to always say, well, now we know what the real truth is, because like, mm -hmm. now we have all the facts. Okay. And of course, I mean, I can tell you that you know, what all the facts were about the origins of human has changed dramatically in the arc of just my incredibly narrow lifetime. So if Neanderthals still existed, then the question, are we alone, if we ask it, we could ask it on behalf of homo state, us, or we could ask it on, in, in, on behalf of... Oh yes, there was certainly a moment in time when homo sapiens and Neanderthals might have understood themselves as being not the same as one another. Well, yes, I'm sure that that was for most of the time they were living side by side or in different islands or something. But how about homo erectus? Uh, same thing. I mean, there was a time, I think, when they were home. There are, mm -hmm. well, there, are, there are multiple versions of Homo. Absolutely. And when in that situation, let's go back, I think it's two million years or so, maybe half a million years, and ask the question, are we alone? Does that take on a different flavor then? Well, you could even ask it in Australia 10,000 years ago. 10,000 years ago. So 10,000 years ago, we know that there was a moment in time when a wave of people arrived in the north of Australia and separated and went, actually, longer ago than that because they would come back together again in the 10,000 year period. They come to the north of Australia, separate one collection of people go down the east coast, the other goes down the west coast. And we're not talking about like a year of grey nomads, we're talking about thousands of years of mm -hmm. progressive settlement yes. across the coasts until you have people coming back together again in the southeast. And we have genetic material, the, the first analysis of it was done last year, so in 2017, to start to see that pattern emerge. But does that change the nature of the question, are we alone? I guess it changes what we is, that's what we're talking about, isn't it? Yeah. And about in what time periods we might have asked that question. Okay. And about whether that question is a, again, I mean, is it a comforting question to ask that? The same way it's, you know, it, do we need to know where we came from in order to move forward? Is knowing where we came from going to be a useful right. activity? Right. Do you and think it, that's a, is that well, useful? I mean, because part of this astrobiological program is to try to figure out how we, life got on this planet yep, and in then order use to that see information it. Yep. to figure out whether it's elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the challenges with the question about how we got to where we are and the kind of unpacking the human project is that it is often used as a cudgel and a weapon, and it becomes, you know, ideas that are weaponized. Think about the way, you know, Darwin's early theoretical articulations were used to say that people of color were not as evolved as white people because they were closer looking to apes. Uh, you know, which so wait, but let me get. So I, I agree with what you said. However, how is it that the human story of I guess you could do, I mean it's not only a story of humans. It's also of any ethnic group. It's mm -hmm. also a story of our species. But it's yep. also stories of mammals. Also a story of vertebrates, mm -hmm. et cetera, yep. et cetera. So it's simultaneously so many levels of identity that it's hard to get racism out of it. Except, except, except for eukaryotism, I guess. Except that we do get racism out of it. Stories about how humans came into being have always been used since we have told those stories yeah. as ways of saying, we are better than them, yeah, yeah. we are superior to that. Yeah. Think about the, you know, we are not mixed race, we are one race, mm. so you know, we have a much 
clearer set of <laughs> residual you know, genetic markers to say we've always been here and we weren't other people. So, you know, is there a scientific project in a you know, relatively instrumentalist way to say can we backtrace the origins of things that make us human and you know, find new ways of telling that story using greater resolution of genetic material because we have greater sample sets of genetic data? Absolutely. Will that science happen absent a set of moral values that get put on top of it? No. So, you know, should the scientific project go ahead? Oh, absolutely. Will people use that scientific project for things it wasn't intended for? Yeah. And do we need to think about those things as having a dialogue? I think we probably do. Okay, I see a red light here. Warning, warning. Astrobiology can be easily used to do what eugenics did 100 years ago or something. Not even 100 years ago. Okay, what, okay whatever. Let's be what, clear, eugenics, you know, was... Okay, what, what it has always been, okay? <laughs> to well, do what racist humans are, and I guess ethnic groups have always done. Sure. But, uh, I mean, you know, so, you know, we've already seen versions of that, right? I mean, not in that astro, astrobiological sense, but in the, when those first websites and services were being built three and four years ago, things like 23andMe, Ancestry's DNA Marker, there's a couple of others, right, that were really lightweight, not particularly robust ways of tracking uh, ancestry and genetic markers. Mm -hmm. Someone scraped the APIs for 23andMe and APIs. Uh, so uh, God, application, what, application protocol interface lets you use move to basically utilize data layers okay. to create access forms. So rather than having all the data, you just create a layer on okay. top of it. I mean, it's how it's a terrible explanation of it, but it's how Airbnb and Uber and a bunch of other things work. It just lets you use data. Someone used the data that 23andMe created to create a race wall. For a particular website, so you Race couldn't, wall. so you couldn't get to the website unless you could prove your genetic material from 23andMe said that you were white. More than well, they don't say white; they say more than 99% European. But they also and a particular variant of European. Well, well, there are many variants of. Yes, indeed. So, but what they were actually basing, starting to say was, we can use a scientific set of markers to determine participation in a particular activity. Okay. Well, I. One of the things that I've been talking about here is, is how you can use science to undo racism. Because mm -hmm. when you look at the phylogenetic trees, very deep ones, you see that, you know, first of all, you see we're all African. Oh, and then next you see that if you're going to divide the human race into, into humans into five, then four of these groups are African, and one is African plus everybody else. Yep. And then I think if you do it to ten groups, then you get something like nine are African, and, and the oh. tenth is African. So anyways, of that oh. nature. So I was I was arguing with somebody who said, this is wonderful stuff, you can undo racism with this mm -hmm. science. And he said, no, you shouldn't even touch it because anything you do will be somehow be used against you. Well, you know, notions about how we create distinction and difference always get mobilized in both ways, right, as an inclusive mechanism and an exclusive mechanism. So it doesn't surprise me that people are starting to use greater degrees of genetic marking activity to create new ways of saying less like you, more like you. Okay, well let's talk about life. I get the feeling that the accusation that you're talking about is uh, you could also apply it to life and say life is better than non-life. I think astrobiologists are almost, almost guilty of that. Do you think that's a? You think that's also something bad? Life versus non-life. You mean like mic microbes don't count, but you have to have no, cell division. No, no. I mean microbes. We're saying if it's a life, then it's worth looking for. If it's no life, it's not worth looking for. For example, in the word in the movie Contact, uh, and Jodie Foster gets asked, uh, "Are we alone?" And she says, "Well, if we are, it's an awful waste of space." Was her response, right? So, and I guess the <laughs> it's a good line. <laughs> What, do you think it's a good line, or is it an incredibly racist line, it's a speciesist line? Well, I mean, you know, it's a good line in a movie. Again, movie's not reality. <laughs> someone, is a good, someone is a good playwright somewhere, wrote right. a good line in a movie. Right. Um, you know, but again, I, I'm, what does it mean to be alive? Okay. And do you have any advice for students who want to become astrobiologists? No. <laughs> Because okay. I did not become an astrobiologist. Okay. And uh, do you have any idea about the public's misconceptions about this? Can you point about to that? About astrobiology? I think we've been talking purely about misconceptions here. Haven't Listen, we? I think, you know, one of the, and I don't think it's a misconception. I think one of the things we all need to be better about, those of us who operate in 
multiple areas of science and technology is that for better or worse, we live in a world where people's imaginations have been primed by at least 100 years of science fiction, some of it visual, some of it barely text, mm -hmm. and that that science fiction works because it taps into deeper, longer standing cultural anxieties and it's easy to dismiss them and go, that's just science fiction or don't be so silly. Mm -hmm. And I think we do ourselves a disservice of not paying attention to the ways that people's imaginations have already been shaped and primed and that we actually need to be both aware of that and more responsive to it and be thoughtful about what it means that you're never talking to someone who has no preconceived notions. And so, you know, how do we operate in a world where people have in some ways spent well, at least a hundred years already imagining the consequences of finding life somewhere else? And are we alone? No.